In 1991, Richard Tarnas released The Passion of the Western Mind, a vast history of Western thought. It became an unexpected bestseller. In it, he argued that Western skepticism and materialism had been a heroic project, but had also created an intellectual prison, and that it was creating a crisis. 27 years on, where are we in that process? In terms of where we are historically and in this moment of history, I think we're at a very uh, pivotal place, very volatile, very uncertain, and all of these qualities um, are very characteristic of this threshold of the death-rebirth process because you have to have an uncertain outcome. You have to have the conviction of uncertainty for uh, such a transformation to uh, actually be successful. You, you have to really feel that everything is at stake and it might not work out for the, the moral transformation to take place. You can't, we all know how what people who have a near-death experience tend to come out of it with a, a rather, rather radical change of their life philosophy. It has a more potent effect in like five seconds than almost anything else they can have. And, uh, but you can't have a pretend near-death experience for it to have that kind of moral, uh, spiritual, psychological transformation. You really have to feel everything's at stake and the result is uncertain. And that's just how we're f experiencing it today, only on a collective scale. The, everything that Joseph Campbell described as, as the initiatory um, experience, like the, the, the crisis of meaning, the being isolated from the rest of the uh, community, the, the sense of uh, facing one's own mortality, uh, the, the, the personal suffering, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the uh, deconstruction of the old identity, or like an old self is dying. Everything that I just described, which is happening on the personal level in an initiation, is what's happening on the collective level to our human civilization, um, except it's now we're looking at planetary mortality rather than just an individual person's mortality. And we're looking at reconstructing, reconceiving the death of, we're having to go through a dying of, a, of our whole identity about how, who we are relative to nature, who we are relative to the cosmos. And are we really living in a disenchanted cosmos in which we're the only uh, intelligent spiritual being in town? Or are we embedded in an ensouled universe of inconceivable uh, uh, depth and mystery uh, and intelligence in, of which we are an expression? Um, we, we're, we are the cosmos in human form. And it's that uh, that happens in the state of spiritual rebirth that uh, uh, we, we reconnect to the sense that, that we, are, we are cosmic beings. And we're also participating in something much bigger than us. So we simultaneously are humbled by the experience, but also exalted by reconnecting to the whole that is infused through us. So I think um, we're at a very dicey place right now where the question is, will enough people, individuals, go through this kind of profound inner transformation and inner work, inner journey, uh, to be able to go through uh, what is basically a kind of symbolic spiritual death so that we don't have to do it literally. Uh, and uh, we've already set in motion destructive forces, and some of those forces are, are you know, already um, affecting the world and probably are going to continue. And the question is, will um, the the kind of near-death experience that we are kind of going through in sort of slow motion right now uh, be sufficient to catalyze enough of a uh, psycho-spiritual transformation in enough people that those people can serve as centers of um, insight and equilibrium 
so uh, to inform the whole in a way. Uh, it, it, it doesn't take everybody to do this, but it takes enough people who are um, able to, their sensibility, their transformation can ripple out, you know, through, uh, through the, the kind of work that you, you, you do with uh, your, your organization and with the, um, with the kinds of uh, access that we have through um, podcasts and, and things that aren't being put on the mainstream channels of television or even taught in the universities. I think uh, that can ripple out enough where um, if enough individuals are carrying that transformation, it can actually help catalyze a, uh, a, a larger transformation in the collective because it's at just such moments of instability uh, that that kind of chaotic disequilibrium can suddenly reconfigure in a new way uh, in ways that are not possible when it's not so uh, volatile. So that's, that's my fervent hope. Uh, and maybe I'll just end this with the idea that hope itself can play a role. I think to have hope and faith in the darkness is very important. And in some sense, it's only in dark periods that, that you develop faith and hope. If everything's just uh, light and glorious and hunky-dory, you don't develop those muscles. You, it's something that happens in, in, in challenging times, and uh, that develops the, the, the moral, spiritual fiber uh, uh, that we need. And hope is, is one of those um, virtues of, that I think cultivating that uh, it will be very important. I read Passion of the Western Mind at university uh, back in 93, 94, and I'd say it probably had the most impact of anything I've ever read um, as a kind of map of the history of Western thinking, where the kind of the bind that we've got ourselves into in terms of Western philosophy and where, how we might get out of it. And for me, a lot of what you wrote about then it still feels very, very current. It still seemed like a very accurate description of where we are and what we're, we're going through. Um, I'm assuming that a, we've got a fairly big audience at the moment. A lot of them have come to us through Jordan Peterson. And the interesting thing for me about Jordan Peterson and the IDW, Intellectual Dark Web Movement, seems to be that the internet is facilitating a kind of intellectual awakening. There's a lot of people devouring Jung, they're devouring a lot of kind of very deep um, philosophical material through, through the, the sort of doorway of Jordan Peterson, which is really exciting. And in, as Rebel Wisdom, what we're trying to do is to, to, to really examine some of these huge ideas and say, what are the ideas that have been sort of maybe on the fringes of our culture? You could say Jung is kind of on the fringes of our culture and has always been sort of out there in the new age and a hugely influential thinker, but, but certainly not part of the mainstream. Um, and I, I'd, I'd argue that you are one of those thinkers as well, hugely influential in, in many different areas, but, but never kind of part of the mainstream. I'd love if you could just introduce yourself and tell me a little bit about your, your background. Life story in, in two minutes. Uh, I, I was born in Geneva, Switzerland of uh, American parents, but grew up in, in the United States. And I was educated uh, up through high school um, by, by Jesuits and, uh, uh, and nuns before that, and kind of got a pretty uh, solid grounding in, in uh, you know, like Greek and Latin and the, and the classics. And, and it, it kind of imbued in me uh, a, an appreciation for, for the the cultural, intellectual, spiritual legacy of the West. And so I was uh, kind of putting together all these different, um, you know, attempting to uh, integrate these different influences. And then I heard about uh, Esalen Institute uh, in California when I was there, which uh, in California, uh, I, when I was still at Harvard is where I first heard about it. And um, it sounded like a place where in a sense, the, the new, a new horizon was opening up of uh, thinkers, teachers, people uh, also putting into practice what these uh, new ideas were that were being drawn from many different 
uh, sources from shamanic traditions, from ancient uh, uh, mystical uh, Asian traditions, from Western esotericism, as well as uh, contemporary uh, psychological practices, thera therapeutic. So, yeah, for people who don't know what SLN is, SLN is now pretty much universally recognized as the sort of the granddaddy of the human potential movement. Right. and Mother Church of the Human Potential Movement, it was called in those years, yeah. You can see you've got a Buddha behind you, so we're in a, we're in a kind of New Age bookshop. Um, and Esalen was sort of seen as the, a, a place where a lot of Eastern traditions came in. But what's really fascinating about your work is that you have a huge respect for an understanding of the, the Western tradition as well. I drank deeply from the wisdom of the East and at a certain point it's in my, in my 20s, I realized that <clears throat> it wasn't a, an East versus West thing. And in fact, there was a great deal of uh, wisdom and depth in the West that uh, I, I, I was informed by. And I, I, I felt that in my generation's uh, desire to kind of wipe the slate clean, overthrow the, the, uh, the oppressive uh, ideas and structures of, my, uh, of our parents and previous generations, that we were cutting ourselves off from, from our own uh, historical uh, legacy, uh, from, our, from our, our ancestry, and, and that that would be a kind of mutilation, and that what we needed to do was to retrieve what was profound uh, in that tradition, while also uh, keeping a clear eye for uh, the shadow uh, of that tradition, which we tended to be unconscious of in the promotion of um, whether it was progress or monotheistic uh, 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 Judeo-Christian religious um, thought. And so uh, I was always trying to kind of keep, hold that that tension of opposites, as Jung would say, the importance of holding um, multiple uh, values that can be in um, tension with each other. And if you can not prematurely fall into one or the other uh, and, and then demonize the other or somehow negate it, but if you can hold faithfully that tension, then uh, there seems to be something in the natural uh, uh, unfolding of the human psyche and of life that moves towards a, a creative synthesis of what is being kind of loyally held uh, as, as, uh, as opposites in tension. And uh, that, that's pretty much what I did uh, and uh, what I sought to do. And, and so Passion of the Western Mind was one example of that, even to the point of also seeking to do that with ideas about the masculine and the feminine as well, uh, <clears throat> to, to recognize that um, there's something deep going on in, uh, in our time uh, that uh, uh, needs, needs addressing, um, this is involving, the, involving gender, but also involving the archetypal dimension behind gender. You, you mentioned synthesis there, and that's really what excites me about the potential of this moment for, for intellectual synthesis. Um, you, you start the epilogue to Passion of the Western Mind with a quote from Robert Bella, which I think is a really profound quote, and we'll maybe sort of bring it up on, on, on screen. I'll try to remember it. Something like, um, we may be seeing the, the reintegration of, of consciousness that will be not on the, the basis of any single understanding of reality, but the understanding that we need to move between different languages um, yeah, different, um, uh, different scientific and imaginative vocabularies, yeah. uh, and and the idea of not ever falling into the uh, illusion that uh, one particular interpretation of reality is uh, reality itself, yeah. but being constantly open to the fact that we are always speaking, you know, symbolically, metaphorically about about a mystery, and and so we have to keep a, a kind of um, humility, a kind of epistemological modesty as we approach uh, the mystery of things. And, and uh, Robert Bella, who um, I deeply valued as a, as a friend and a, and a teacher, um, his great book, uh, Religion and Human Evolution, that he 
uh, finished just before he died, 14-year project, just a magnificent work. Anyway, uh, Bella really uh, carried that. He wrote that in 1969, and, and it is a, a beautiful rendering of our need to um, hold a, a, a plurality of perspectives as, and, and not fall into some single literal uh, understanding. The reason I brought up the Robert Bella quote is that I, I see some parallels with this intellectual dark web that's arisen. Jordan Peterson, what, why I sort of got very deeply into Jordan Peterson was recognizing that he represents a real synthesis. He uses the Jungian model, but he also links it to the evolutionary model. He uses evolutionary biology, he uses psychology, he uses um, developmental psychology like Jean Piaget to talk about the evolution of morality and synthesizes many different ways of looking at the world. And then you have within the, the same IDW constellation someone like Brett Weinstein, who is a very, very deep evolutionary biologist who maps on what he understands to what Peterson understands and says, yes, there's a, there's a real... Um, uh, he, he actually told me all, all true maps must converge. So this sort of sense that there is the potential for all of these different maps moving towards a similar point. I, I wonder and I'm, I'm hopeful that this great intellectual awakening could be the time of that, of that great intellectual synthesis. You, yes, you... It'll, I think it has to happen, but uh, because there is so much, um, I mean, on the one hand, anybody with a, with a good contemporary, uh, you know, modern, early postmodern education uh, has, sees the unmistakable uh, value of, of, a, of, you know, evolutionary sciences, of, um, of the sciences generally, etc. But uh, if they are sufficiently um, broad-minded and curious and open, haven't been shut down uh, inside into a into an, a, a narrow uh, uh, perspective, they they recognize that um, statistics and uh, mechanistic scientific explanations do not capture the full experience of of of, of human reality. And uh, anybody that does uh, deep inner, inner, inner work or journeys or uh, sacred medicine rituals uh, uh, or, or uh, an LSD experience uh, will have a glimpse that there is something more, as William James would put it, capital S, capital M, something more than is uh, explicable by our by our philosophies, uh, as you know, Shakespeare's uh, "There are more things in heaven and earth," Horatio, than are than are dreamt of in our philosophy. So um, I think we 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 have these um, what can be warring sides and, uh, within all of us. I think of it within the West in particular as a a conflict between the Enlightenment. Uh, with its uh, rationalist scientific um, uh, loyalties, its, its allegiance to the modern mind, you might say, and romanticism in the broad sense that goes right up to the psychedelic counterculture of the 60s, and so, which, is, which the modern soul is loyal to, as it were, if we can make that distinction. And uh, we all have that in our, in our being. We all, we all have romanticism and the Enlightenment um, uh, as essential to who we are, but there's something about the way the modern worldview emerged in which the, the rationalist scientific enlightenment more or less has the uh, center of gravity for understanding the external physical natural world. And the, uh, well, romanticism is what uh, speaks to our souls where we, we, we where we, we read our poetry, we take seriously, uh, we're moved by our music, we take seriously the, the artistic uh, epiphanies that open up to us a, a, a deeper view of reality. We, we appreciate uh, the, the spiritual experiences we have when we uh, are walking through a redwood forest or watching um, a, a sunset over the, over the ocean. 
uh, these are um, precious to us in ways that can't be um, uh, explained by a reductionist scientific view. So we have both of these loyalties within us. And uh, uh, un until we have that some deep reconnecting between this, the inner and the outer, as it were, or between mind and soul, or between the Enlightenment and Romanticism, also between East and West, also we could say between North and South, uh, if we bring in that idea of the, you know, the, the larger range of, of, of cultures and, and uh, cultural traditions that are carried in the, in the two uh, northern and southern hemispheres and how important that integration is for our future. And then finally, uh, between the human being and the, and the rest of the, of the Earth's uh, community, um, that, that separation has been catastrophic. And that separation has roots in, in both the uh, Western scientific and religious uh, tradition in complex ways. Uh, so there's a number of fundamental healings of, of, uh, of these uh, schisms or uh, um, bifurcations, these, these polarities that the future of our, of our species really uh, depends on, I think, moving into a, uh, an integration. And you, you have a really beautiful way of describing that we, we have attempted to purge ourselves of any anthropomorphic projections towards the world, but what we've ultimately done is created the ultimate anthropomorphic projection. Would you like to explain what, what kind of, yes. as an overview, what, what is the situation we find ourselves in? Yes. Uh, and, and then what that synthesis might look like? It's a great paradox um, because I think uh, we can see how the, the, the modern mind from you know, Descartes and Bacon and Locke uh, onward, uh, we're very much focused on uh, moving out of an anthropocentric point of view. <clears throat> and you can actually see, obviously, the Copernican Revolution is seen as being like the, the Ur moment, the, uh, the, the, the primal transformation out of an assumed uh, uh, cosmology in which the Earth is the center and therefore uh, this is seen that the human being is is the center of cosmic design, as it were, and uh, and then suddenly we're a, a, a spinning, moving uh, planet, one amongst many, uh, and then there turns out there's billions of suns uh, in uh, a galaxy that itself is one of billions of galaxies. So you have just this sequence of. Um, breaking out of the anthropocentric uh, perspective. This is kind of how the story would be told usually. And, and until we become seen as being radically peripheral. And part of that movement towards uh, cleansing our perception of anthropocentric assumptions is to believe that uh, only the human being is capable of meaning and purpose. Uh, and uh, if, you, um, if you think that the world outside the human being is carrying meaning and purpose, as for example, when a synchronicity happens and there's some, uh, some powerful, seems as if uh, life has conspired to suddenly uh, bring together a coincidence of such um, uncanny meaning to, to one that, you, that it, it kind of shifts your consciousness of like, wow, there's something going on here that's mysterious. And um, the, the, the mainstream skeptical point of view on this would be, if you think that's the case, then you're projecting what is uh, basically human meaning onto the non-human world, and that's a basic epistemological error. It's childish thinking. It's, uh, it's, it suggests delusions of self-reference. And if you do a lot of that, uh, we may recommend that you uh, see a psychiatrist and, and perhaps have medication. Um, and behind this sequence of, of thinking is the conviction that only uh, the human being is a um, locus of uh, 
attention, intention, agency, spirit, soul, uh, uh, purposeful conscious intelligence, and that the world itself, apart from the human, is, or perhaps a few of the more complex uh, uh, higher uh, uh, mammals and, and birds, that aside from that, uh, really human beings are the exclusive locus of uh, conscious pur purposeful intelligence and the world apart from the human is unconscious, purposeless, and meaningless. And that only uh, human beings have to find uh, value and meaning that can, uh, through the development of their rational capacities and so forth. Which you've likened to a kind of mental prison that we've made for ourselves. Yes, but it, it was a liberating move at first. <clears throat> because the because it was an attempt to break out of a particular um, cosmology ideology that uh, had become very uh, confining. Um, Fatalistic it, and it, 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 what was the word used? Fatalistic. Fatalistic. Yes, that you <clears throat> that human beings were not in control of their own destiny. Mm -hmm. That either. Um, uh, the, the cosmos or nature or a transcendent God was determining our reality and we needed to break out of that and to just see that human beings had to define their own reality. So it was very empowering to have that assumption. But in cleansing the, the uh, perception of, of any potential anthropocentric uh, and anthropomorphic um, projections onto nature, uh, we fell into a trap because that too is a, a kind of assumption, as Rupert Sheldrake says, uh, the assumption that the world is a machine and that we are, are, are the one conscious purposeful intelligence uh, presumes that, uh, that, the, that the machine is something that is found in a state of nature, but in fact the machine is just something created by human beings. Nature is a much more mysterious phenomenon. And uh, in many ways, I'll just make two points on this. One is that the assumption uh, that only human beings are capable of meaning and purpose is an enormous uh, inflation of the human being. It's as if we have taken all the potential meaning and purpose that was seen by, uh, uh, by every other culture before the modern as pervading nature, the cosmos, the earth, animals, plants, uh, the heavens. Um, it's as if, like a vacuum cleaner, we've sucked that all up and loca reloc relocated it inside the human cranium. and and claim this for ourselves alone, which is a rather remarkable act of human hubris if you step back and look at it from that point of view. And the, um, the co corollary of that is if you look at uh, the pride that m moderns take about we are the first ones that recognize that the earth is moving, that we, we are not the center of the universe, etc. Um, why is it that uh, indigenous cultures who weren't aware of the earth moving uh, tend to be much less anthropocentric in their practice of life than uh, modern civilization, which has been so anthropocentric that it's, that it's uh, crashing the biosphere uh, with its um, in industrialized uh, exploitation uh, of, of the natural environment and, and uh, uh, radical upsetting of the, of the uh, ecological balances to the point that we have catalyzed uh, uh, mass extinctions and, and um, melting of polar ice caps and uh, extreme climate uh, events that are are really causing you know tremendous hardship for many uh, species, including our, our own most vulnerable members of our own species. So there's been a great price that has been played, uh, paid for the hubris of this um, appropriation of all meaning and purpose into the human being in the effort to free ourselves of anthropocentric 
assumptions. It's one of those paradoxes, uh, the, the, the unforeseen consequences of good intentions that uh, characterize history. Because mm. that's the other thing about the, the passion of the Western mind. It, as you said before, it's a very much a two-sided story. There's a sense of this kind of great Apollonian project to free ourselves from nature that is, that, that is a very positive project in many ways, but also there is a shadow side to it as well in terms of how much it's cut ourselves off from a, a lot of, from nature itself, obviously, but also from some of our own inner knowing. And this sort of rationality, and I, I guess you, you alluded to sort of masculine and feminine before, which is a, one way of looking at it, sort of the intuition versus the rationality. What do you think this synthesis, because you, 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 you talk about the potential for synthesis, especially in the epilogue to Passion of the Western Mind. What do you think the synthesis looks like? What do we need to recognize and what do we need to integrate? Well, I've <clears throat> spoken of a number of the kinds of uh, syntheses I have in mind um, b between uh, you could say between uh, mind and heart, uh, also between um, mind and body uh, to get in touch with our body. Our, our bodies really are, one way of putting it is that we, we need to recognize that uh, all of the faculties that we have as human beings are necessary for us to cultivate, to be able to uh, to adequately register the richness of, of reality, that a, a kind of narrow-minded, uh, almost puritanical rationality uh, and narrow empiricism that doesn't pay attention to the breadth of human experience, for example, but is, is very uh, quantitatively uh, limited, then uh, to that extent, we are going to be uh, uh, really cut off from our from the full range of of what reality is about. We're going to be locked up in a, in a in a kind of prison that could could be very destructive, as we're seeing in practice, because a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing, and uh, a lot of knowledge from a very narrow perspective, uh, which is what I would argue is the uh, mainstream epistemology. Uh, can be a catastrophically dangerous thing. Uh, I would say, uh, so one integration is of um, all these different, uh, we need our relational intelligence, our emotional intelligence, our, the full range of the imaginative and intuitive uh, capacities, our, our somatic intelligence, kinesthetic, aesthetic, um, how, how important uh, beauty is for for uh, illuminating what is important uh, in, in life. Um, and deep beauty, not shallow beauty, uh, and to be able to recognize what is deep or what is shallow. These are, these are kind of educational goals, as it were, that I think we, our, our educational systems, n need to uh, integrate into, and cultivate in, in, our, in our students so that we just don't all end up as uh, kind of technicians uh, working with dashboard knowledge, as, as Owen Barfield put it. Could I address one point uh, that you mentioned about the rationality and intuition and its connection to feminine and masculine, or masculine and feminine? Uh, I've, I've gone through... Uh, of course, I'm aware of uh, uh, Jordan Peterson's um, number of comments he's made along along uh, the line of what's what's feminine and what's masculine, and uh, of course he, he's drawing on um, among other things certain things that Jung wrote, Carl Gustav Jung. And uh, in that epilogue, of Passion of the Western Mind, I also talked about at the at the very end the idea that we we have had a very masculine dominated civilization that uh, profoundly needs to reconnect with the feminine ground of being, uh, with all that has been um, uh, separated, differentiated from, 
and in many ways, uh, uh, you know, oppressed, uh, suppressed in the effort to create this kind of powerful, uh, autonomous, um, intelligent, advancing species, which had the name in English, as in other languages, uh, uh, with the patriarchal word man. You know, it's been um, man this, you know, the ascent of man, the dignity of man, man's conquest of space, and things like that. It's that, that way of summing up the whole, whole human being as, as masculine uh, with that image um, bespeaks a, 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 a profound uh, you know, separation from uh, so much of what it is to be human. But since I wrote that epilogue, which was you know, now uh, 30 years ago, uh, I have had um, m thought a lot more about uh, the, the somewhat simple, um, you know, complex but still in some ways simplified drama that I painted in the, those last pages of the, uh, of the epilogue. And I've come to realize, uh, and this is partly, you know, here I live in, in San Francisco, uh, working with graduate students the last 20, 30 years, and very in touch with, 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 with um, feminism, with various postmodern um, movements that are kind of opening up our sense of gender uh, and all sorts of assumptions uh, in, in patriarchy, etc. And, uh, and there have been critiques uh, within the Jungian world, for example, of the, what is the feminine and what is the masculine. And also within feminism itself, there have been uh, conflicts between uh, uh, different schools. And as a result of this, a number of us have been uh, developing a, uh, a, a perspective that uh, builds on Jung's great insight, because he, he did, he made very big breakthroughs in uh, recognizing the dignity of, of uh, women's, women and women's psychology and also what men have cut off from themselves that is causing them to become soulless. Uh, uh, but at the same time, he was carrying certain patriarchal assumptions that go way back. And I mean, he, the culture he came from was very patriarchal. And he still had ideas about what was natural for a, a woman. Um, a woman's place was still pretty much in the home, even though he was calling on them to develop their masculine side of rationality and capacity for assertion, and calling on men to develop their feminine side uh, of intuition, of feeling, relationality, and so forth. But as soon as we assign rationality to one gender over another, uh, and feeling or caring, the capacity of caring to one gender or another, we're doing something that isn't quite fair to the complexity of, of those, um, of, a, of every human being. And so uh, what has been emerging, a, a, a group of uh, Jungians, feminists, uh, uh, contemporary thinkers, and I have been uh, developing this idea of there being a, uh, both a lunar and a solar form of the masculine and a lunar and, the, and solar form of the feminine, so that uh, the, the solar masculine is the kind of patriarchal ide ideal or stereotype, but there is a lunar masculine that when a, when a, when a father is holding his child tenderly and, and supporting his wife to go out into the world and to be uh, an independent um, person, uh, as uh, while still being in um, intimate relationship, uh, that is uh, his. That's not just him cultivating his feminine side. It's a part of his manhood that he's that he's caring, that he's in touch with his emotions, that he's capable of relationality, and uh, to to assign rationality just to him and that the only way a woman can connect to rationality is to develop her, the, her inner man, um, in some sense impoverishes the, the, the full depth and breadth of what it is to be a woman. And the same thing, conversely, for a man. So 
uh, we've been using this more nuanced language uh, that recognizes that basically men certainly need to develop their 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 lunar side, the the, the side that is uh, capable of being in touch with their their feelings, their relational capacities, their emotional intelligence, their intuitive abilities to comprehend the whole beyond kind of analytic reason. Um, and that's, that's part of their wholeness uh, that badly needs to be integrated. And the same thing for, uh, for uh, women's development of their capacity for autonomy, for, uh, uh, for a kind of a very, uh, for the public uh, life, not just the private, uh, for uh, rational uh, assertion in the world and so forth. That all these are, um, I think it, it's a little too simplistic to um, put it all into terms of the masculine and the feminine, even though we're saying that, the, that both are in both of us, because you can never really to say anything about the feminine without thinking about women and the masculine without thinking about men. And even in really wonderful Jungians, like uh, people uh, who I greatly regard, uh, women uh, Jungians like uh, Marion Woodman, who just passed away, or uh, uh, they, they will talk about the feminine uh, in one sentence about the feminine in all of us, and then in the next sentence, the feminine is talking about female psychology, and they haven't um, noted that they went from one meaning to the other because it's an unconscious conflation. So we're just trying to uh, come up with more precise ways of um, showing the rich nuance within all of us. And I think that Jordan Peterson may at times um, find himself uh, getting more uh, intense um, blowback from people who are hearing what seems like slightly stereotypical assertions about what it is to be feminine, what it is to be masculine. And, and if we enrich our vocabulary a bit, a bit we can see that uh, while women certainly have a, a, a kind of great um, special relationship, as it were, to this you know, lunar uh, dimension of, of life, uh, the ruler of the night sky, the connection to um, soul depth, etc., and men conversely with the, with the solar, but to limit it to them and, and, you, and use that language, the feminine and the, mas the masculine, is, uh, still keeps perpetuating a kind of patriarchal bifurcation. Um, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. What, what do you make of the Jordan Peterson phenomena? I gave you my kind of take on it before. Yes. Um, I think your work has uh, been very uh, helpful in um, showing the, the, uh, the value of what uh, Jordan Peterson is doing while also <clears throat> recognizing that you know, he's, he it's not the, doesn't have the last word on things and in some ways he can, he can um, be uh, I, th I think in some ways there's, there's certain simplifications that uh, he makes that are, that are problematic. And I, get, I just gave one set of them there with masculine and feminine. But uh, it's also striking to me how much he gets simplistically misunderstood by uh, both sides um, in, in the effort to impose a kind of stereotype on him, uh, which he, I mean, that famous, uh, was it a BBC or Channel 4 interview with... Uh, Channel 4, with Channel, Kathy Newman. Ch Channel 4 interview with, with Kathy Newman was uh, quite uh, an example of that, where um, it didn't seem like she was really hearing the uh, complexity of what he was saying and already had a a pigeonhole that she was trying to kind of hammer him into and he was reacting against. Um, I'm, uh, I deeply admire his capacity to um, engage the world with a, a kind of articulate force. He, uh, he's about uh, 12 years younger than I am and 
uh, I think has just a little bit more extroverted um, uh, predispos predispositions in him than I do, uh, where I, you know, I, I prefer being a little uh, less at the focus of, even though some of my, my work obviously pushes boundaries, um, I'm not as um, eager f as he seems to be, or he certainly is capable of handling, just a tremendous amount of like controversy and the onslaught of uh, aggressive questioning and so forth. Uh, and, he, and he tends to do well under aggressive questioning, which um, not, not all of us do. I think in general, aggressive questioning can make it more difficult for the person who's being questioned and the questioner to, to un dig deeper and unpack uh, uh, a, a more profound understanding that might reflect um, something that wouldn't have been included had that dialogue not taken place. So, but I have to say I, I am in uh, real admiration of, even though I don't agree with everything um, that Jordan Peterson says, it's, it's, uh, I really admire his spirit, uh, his capacity to uh, think under pressure and speak uh, to a number of audiences, and his, um, and the fact that he is, I see him as, I think some of the force that's coming through him is uh, collective. It's, he, is a, he is a kind of channel for things that haven't been said for a while uh, and that uh, in some sense uh, needed to be said. It's a, you know, he's a, he's a kind of channel of the return of the repressed in that sense. And he has the articulate uh, potency of a person who is caring more than just his personal thinking. He's, he's, he's got a, a, a kind of collective psyche's uh, archetypal drive that is uh, informing what, what and how he is saying what he is. What do you think those things are, those repressed archetypal things? Well, w well one is to um, certainly his, his calling upon uh, men to um, kind of basically find their strong center again and take responsibility for their lives and their actions and uh, to uh, become disciplined and uh, what what uh, depth psychologists would say would be to, uh, to, to basically integrate the Senex, the, the, that, the, the Saturn archetype, the archetype that brings in uh, a capacity for, for, for self-discipline, for a backbone, for, uh, that's grounded in tradition. And you, you, you must also, given, given your work, be very pleased to see him kind of bringing Jung back into the mainstream or talking about Jung in such a high-profile way. Yes, uh, there, there are, um, I don't know how much that's coming in as a, uh, a return of the repressed, but it, but, you know, it's, it's interesting, Jung himself, uh, over the last decades, seems to be going through uh, a, quite a, uh, an elevation within the culture. And when the New York Times gave that, you know, 17 pages in the New York Times magazine, to the publication of Jung's Red Book uh, about 10 years ago. Um, that was pretty much the first positive thing that the New York Times had allowed itself to say about Jung since the very good obituary that it wrote for him in 1961. Um, it, it got kind of overtaken by a, by, you know, a kind of, um, you know, narrower Freudian uh, uh, intellectual viewpoint and then an, even anti-Freud at a certain point, anti-depth psychology generally. And I think um, the more we're moving into what I would think of as the deeper and more mature form of the postmodern, and the more uh, voices that are being uh, allowed into the uh, uh, cultural conversation, the more uh, Jung, I think, is going to be recognized as not a flawless thinker, but a, but a necessary uh, and deep one, necessary for us to, to assimilate. He, he, he was carrying uh, deep, deep truths that came from a very deep dive that he took, a, a kind of almost shamanic descent uh, 
that spontaneously uh, happened to him uh, in uh, the 1913 to 1920 period, and he came out of that with with uh, real treasures, like basically, the, and that he gave to the culture. The idea that um, we don't understand human psychology unless we understand that psyche is soul, and that uh, there is a spiritual dimension to uh, uh, human existence and to human fulfillment that. If we do not take account of it, we are mutilating our, our, ourselves and will never really be psychologically healthy. Or his, his recognition that um, we're all embedded in a larger collective uh, psyche that is evolving and that is, is going through its own spiritual transformations and that we're in a kind of adventure of, of, of consciousness individually as well as uh, collectively. I think Jung's recognition of in the on the individual level of how important the second half of life is, and the turn towards uh, away from external public achievement and more recognizing that the inner world and finding uh, meaning and finding a spiritual fulfillment that is not dependent on. Uh, youth and uh, a kind of robust uh, um, a, a quality of uh, being in the world, but has, is, is co connecting with some uh, deeper sources of, of archetypal meaning and purpose that give us um, a, a sense of life's value. All, all these are, are crucial gifts that Jung gave us and, and I think more and more people are assimilating. And you mentioned Esselen before and at, at that time the, we're talking about kind of intellectual dark web now, a constellation of thinkers. There was quite a mighty constellation of thinkers around Esselen. I mean you, you can probably tell me more of the names but I think Joseph Campbell was there, Stan Groff was there, um, Abraham Maslow was there? Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I mean, it, it's an amazing um, place. I mean, for, it, first of all, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. But because of its uh, um, kind of mission, uh, founded in 1962, and Abraham Maslow and his sense of uh, it's interesting. Maslow was walk was driving through Big Sur, uh, which can sometimes be quite foggy, and it's a a narrow highway on going along a cliff, and he got lost. And he saw the sign for Esalen Institute uh, right right after it had been started. And he came down the hill to sort of find out where he was. And he came into the lodge, and there he saw people reading uh, his book uh, uh, towards the you know new psych a psychology of being. And um, he uh, and and so Maslow was in that whole idea of self-realization. Um, it was very important. Uh, so many, um, of course, there are a lot of psychotherapists like uh, Fritz Perls and uh, uh, R.D. Lang and <clears throat> also people who are working within the body area uh, like uh, Ida Rolf and Rolfing, uh, uh, Feldenkrais. But you also had people who were uh, like Fritjof Capra, Joseph Campbell, Gregory Bateson, uh, Jean Houston, Stan Groff was there as the uh, scholar in residence for, for 17 years and he, he brought in um, people like um, uh, the uh, Rupert Sheldrake and um, David Bohm and uh, people who were uh, kind of opening up the... Uh, Terence came uh, as well. We had an uh, excellent uh, conference on uh, all the early psychedelic pioneers were there. Albert Hoffman uh, came from, who uh, synthesized and discovered uh, LSD. He came, and of course, uh, Stan Groff and, and Terence represented like the, the next generation of, um, uh, and there's another example of someone sort of hyper articulate uh, and, and and definitely had a kind of charismatic uh, quality that seems to have been infused by his uh, psychedelic explorations. So anyway, yes, it was a uh, 
countercultural uh, uh, maelstrom and, and uh, hotbed of, of n new uh, and ancient uh, thinking, practices, ideas that um, rippled out into the world. I'll, I'll, well, it's, it's still in existence and is a great place to visit, but I think in many ways it was uh, during the uh, 60s and 70s that it really uh, brought its gift into the world and disseminated it out and, uh, so that um, many, many others have been carrying it out in, in other parts of the world since then.